Welcome and thank you for joining session one of CIFAR's Understanding Corporate Governance and Internal Investigations webinar series. All participants are in listen-only mode. You are encouraged to submit questions throughout the program using the Q&A section located on the right side of your WebEx window. We will do our best to get to everyone's questions. Any unanswered questions will be followed up by email after the webinar. For those interested in CLE credit, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation. Please write this code down. It will not be repeated and is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and presentation materials will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. At this time, I'd like to turn the program over to Greg Martell. Greg, you may begin. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon for all of you in the uh, Eastern time zone, uh, not in the Eastern time zone. And uh, we are, uh, good morning. Um, so um, my, my name, Greg Markell. I'm chairman of the litigation department of Safar Shaw's New York office, co-chair of the National Securities Litigation Practice. Uh, I'm a trial lawyer uh, of, for a number of years doing commercial contract litigation, securities litigation, directors and officers defense, mergers, corporate governance litigation, antitrust litigation. Um, I'm, I am uh, ranked by chambers have been for a number of years um, and also by best lawyers and uh, a number of other publications um, I've, uh, my um, my main focus in uh, trial work is uh, is on large high stakes litigation and um, I have co-chaired the annual Securities Litigation Institute in New York for 12 years uh, with Brad Karp and I have been co-chairs. Uh, and uh, that I am also, and this is something that's relatively recent, in the last six or seven years, the chairman of the Center for Corporate Governance at the New York County Lawyers Association. And so um, that is, I've developed an interest in that area and over the years, and uh, that is, and I'm interested in the topic that we're going to talk, be talking to to all of you about today. With me today, as the other panelists, the co-panelists on this uh, webinar is Sarah Fedner. Um, I'm going to come back to Sarah's position in a moment, but um, she is. Uh, she concentrates her practice in this area of securities, derivative litigation, internal investigations, real estate litigation, general commercial litigation. She's uh, done many depositions, interviewed many witnesses, uh, has a, a number of court appearances, and um, and she's an excellent writer uh, of motions and other uh, file documents that are filed in cases. Uh, I, I have felt since I met, first met her about six or seven years ago that uh, she plays a game that is a, above her uh, number of years of experience and, and her ranking. Um, she's now, she now is one of a number of very strong associates uh, that we have in the litigation department in the in Cypher Shaw um, but I do think I've thought that uh, working with her has always been a, a pleasure whether it be on cases or webinars because uh, she, she is extremely able in all of those areas um, and uh, we always look forward to seeing people's reviews of the of the presentations uh, and see where where we both can improve, but I, I'll be interested to, to know whether or not uh, you're somewhat surprised that she is a, a senior associate and not already a partner. Um, so moving on, uh, we are going to, uh, we're going to talk about corporate governance and I have a short introduction on the corporate governance topic. So, what is corporate governance? Well, corporate governance 
is how a, co comp a corporation is governed, not too surprising from the name, that that is what it is about. And it, we also talk about how the corporation is structured, how, how decision making uh, is allocated. Uh, we discuss the duties of directors and management, uh, and we will uh, we will be focusing primarily on Delaware law in this. Um, there's some variation from state to state, but not very much. Mo the, the, the most basic principles uh, are pretty standard from state to state. There may be slightly different language, slightly different approaches, but Delaware law, as is consistent with the fact that the many corporations are based there, is the uh, is is so an area is Delaware law is what other states often look to in determining what what uh, laws to put on their books relating to management of corporations. Uh, and now with that, I'm going to turn this over to Sarah to to start off talking about uh, our first topic. Thank you for that very kind introduction, Greg. Um, so I will just jump into it um, with some of the basic principles of corporate governance. So in general, the board of directors of a company has ultimate decision-making authority on behalf of that company. And they are allotted a fairly broad um, discretion and acting on behalf of the company. But in doing so, there are certain fiduciary duties that they are required to uphold. Um, and if they fail to uphold these fiduciary duties and acting on behalf of the company, they can face certain litigation risks. Um, if they also hold up their fiduciary duties, they are generally given the deference of what is known as the business judgment rule, which Greg will get into in more depth later on in this presentation, but basically, um, as long as the board is upholding its fiduciary duties, courts are gonna defer to the decision of the board. They're not gonna get into the weeds of how a company should be managed. Um, in deciding what, how to act on behalf of the corporation, a board of directors has the ability to delegate um, certain topics or issues to committees or officers and they can also consult with experts um, to try to make decisions on behalf of the company, especially where there's a really technical decision involved. So throughout this presentation, we're gonna get into what specifically are these fiduciary duties that directors and officers are required to uphold and what are some practical takeaways for how they can fulfill these duties and minimize liability risks. And with that, I will turn it back over to Greg. Right, so I'm gonna now talk about director's duties and we'll be talking more about directors than officers, but there are gonna be a couple of important points uh, about officer, officer's duties that will come up a little bit later in, the, in this uh, presentation. So directors are responsible for making all major decisions on behalf of a corporation which have not been delegated to a manage to ma either management or to a committee. Uh, it, they, as Sarah said, you can the, the board can decide that someone else should decide an issue, but absent that, they have they have uh, the authority and the ultimate authority on 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 all major decisions. Um, they have a duty to determine the overall business goals and objectives of the company. And, and that's important because um, the a corporation needs, particularly, particularly mid-sized and larger corporations, need to think about what objectives and goals they have, and they can be adopted by by a by a uh, corporation in the context of a certificate of corporation or a, the bylaws. Um, they all, the board of directors also has to oversee utilization of and budgeting expenses and how how 
money is spent by the corporation. That is, they have to oversee it. They don't necessarily always have to get into the weeds of how money is spent, but they, they do have to give general guidance on how to spend money. Um, they have, uh, the, the board does have a responsibility to oversee management of the business and they get to decide who will be, who will manage the, the business daily operations. Typically a board, if, if there is a quorum, if the necessary quorum is available, can decide whether to hire someone as CEO or and any every other officer position, uh, or to turn and they and to terminate someone in those positions. So it is their job to to oversee management and see and see that the management is doing a good job of running the business as a business. Uh, the they have also, and this is something we'll get into in more detail later on, but the board has a duty to oversee compliance uh, of, with laws, with uh, regulations, with company policies. And they do that not by day-to-day hands-on work, but they do it by uh, having a system of information flow that, it, uh, that will cause important issues relating to those matters to get back to the board. And we'll, we will also spend some more some time on that because there has been a lot of recent law on the question of what, what oversight a director is responsible for. Um, generally, uh, generally, the board or a committee of the board plays a central role in dealing with, with mergers, acquisitions, selling and also uh, buying uh, significant pieces of the business. In other words, M&A type transaction. The board, the board generally ends up with the final decisions on those things, All, although sometimes that is delegated to a committee for decision. More often, a committee is appointed to help negotiate those besides the board has the final say in what in what what takes place um, so now i uh we're moving on so we're, i'm going to move back to the to sarah and she is going to talk about more with more specificity some of the fiduciary duties that the corporation uh that the cor that the that the board owes to the corporation and to shareholders Yes, so we will get into the details of what are some of the main duties that directors and officers are required to uphold. Now, two of the main ones that a lot of people have probably heard of are the duty of care and duty of loyalty. There is a ton of case law on these duties, um, and I recommend, depending on your jurisdiction, looking up the specifics of what the duties require. But in general, the duty of care requires directors and officers to act in a reasonably diligent and informed manner when making decisions on behalf of the corporation. So you don't want um, board members who aren't fully informed on an issue making a decision. They don't need to know every single little detail, but they should know all of the material information relevant to whatever decision it is they're making. Um, the duty of care could be um, a statutory duty, depending on what jurisdiction you're in. For example, in New York State, um, there's a statute related to the duty of care. Um, but in other jurisdictions, it may be based on the case law, but I would encourage you to look up whether there's a statute on point or whether or not it's just based on case law. The duty of loyalty really focuses on directors and officers acting in the best interest of the corporation and its shareholders always, um, and never choosing their personal benefit over um, that of the corporation or shareholders. So this means that, um, you know, if, if there's some sort of conflict of interest that a board member may have, they need to disclose it and potentially 
they can't be involved in a decision that involves that um, conflicted matter. Um, they're not supposed to derive a personal profit at the expense of the corporation, and they're required to treat all shareholders fairly. Um, there's, as I mentioned, there's an exception to this general rule of the duty of loyalty where um, a director or officer is not expected to, or is not allowed to make a decision that personally benefits them. Um, there are some cases where perhaps there's a decision, maybe it's a deal or something like that that does personally benefit a board member, but it doesn't necessarily conflict with the interests of the corporation. In those situations, it's important for a disinterested group of board members to make the ultimate decision on that matter. The director who stands to personally benefit should not be involved in the decision in order for everyone to uphold their fiduciary duties, but there may be some scenarios where there could be a personal benefit for some of the board members and also the benefit um, to the corporation just because um, a board member has a benefit that may come from a deal or transaction doesn't necessarily mean they're breaching their duty of loyalty. Their personal benefit can just never come before that of the corporation. Um, the duty of independence um, in good faith and fair dealing. This is somewhat of a, a lesser talked about um, duty. Some legal experts think it falls within the duty of loyalty. Others think that no, this is a much broader um, duty. And generally it requires to, it requires board members to act in an independent manner, to act honestly, um, to exercise their best business judgment um, in making decisions and to always try to act in the best interest of the corporation. It's simply, it's you want your board of directors to be acting in an honest and honorable and professional manner on behalf of the company. So in that sense, it's a little bit broader than the duty of loyalty. Um, it's not just considering whether or not a board member has a personal interest. It's really are they acting free of undue influence? Um, are they exercising their own reasonable judgment um, and making decisions that are not controlled by others? There is also the duty of disclosure and candor. This generally comes up when there is some sort of um, shareholder vote or perhaps a situation like I mentioned before where there's a decision where one director or officer has a personal interest in the decision. So in that case, um, the director or officer who has the personal interest or if it's a shareholder vote, the entire board needs to disclose all material information relevant to that decision. Again, they don't have to disclose every single detail, but anything that would be considered material to the decision needs to be disclosed to the decision maker, whether that's a group of shareholders or whether that's a smaller group of disinterested board members, directors and officers need to make sure that they're transparent on everything that's material to the decision being made. And with that, I will turn it to Greg for the last duty, um, a discussion of the duty of oversight and the Marshan case requirements. Right. So, I, we need to go through a little history of the development of this law in order to to understand it and why why it is still um, not as crystal clear what the law is even in Delaware as you would expect. So first of all, what is the duty of oversight? And I and I do uh, I did allude to what the duty of oversight is in, without using that term earlier. Uh, so directors typically, particularly in, in most cases, that um, at least some, if not a, a majority of the directors are not people who are around the company every day. They come to board meetings. There might be four a year, there might be eight a year, there might be 12 a year, but, the, but, to, but they, are, they then are perhaps at the company for two or three days each time. But they are not—they're they're not every day 
participant. Most of, that is, I'm now talking about most of the board members. There will be there will be board members who are officers and pretty much every day are at the company. But the duty of oversight primarily uh, comes up in the context of looking at the actions of a board as a whole or, or a committee as a whole. Uh, and so I'm gonna primarily look at the, what the majority of the board members have, and that is they are part they are part time at the company. They do get materials from the company to read to keep them up to speed. But as time has gone by in recent years, there's more and more material as companies get more complicated and as products get more uh, more complicated in in a lot of businesses. And the result is that there is a tremendous amount uh, there's a tremendous amount of work for board members who may have more a limited number of meetings uh, among themselves. It becomes very difficult for board members, therefore, to keep track of, of a lot of many things that are going on in the company and pretty much impossible to keep track of everything that's, that's uh, going on in the company. So what has evolved as a as an issue in the law is how do you determine what things board members need to be aware of and and act on if there's something going wrong if there's a problem in uh back in the 90s there was a, a case that came down called the Caremark case in Delaware and and the, the it, it actually had a full name with both parties, but the, the, it's always known in uh, this business as the Caremark case. And there are what are called Caremark duties in a Caremark type of case. And in that case, the uh, there was a failure of the board to act on something that quite arguably they didn't know about going on in the company. And the Supreme Court of Delaware in the decision in the Caremark case said, this is the hardest thing uh, that, that the hardest kind of uh, claim that a plaintiff can have, a, a claim that the, that the board failed to o oversee the activities of the company. And I, it was clearly something that the, that the Delaware Supreme Court felt uh, in in connection with wanting to protect directors from having to know everything that's going on in a, in a company, uh, something which is, as I said a few minutes ago, impossible. And and perhaps there are some people, and I think perhaps the Marchand Court, which I'm going to get to in a minute, uh, felt that that perhaps was going just a little bit too far in protecting uh, uh, directors. And so there has there was lots of debate between professors, between corporate uh, officers, between board members in the public area in the public area of just how much is a board required to know in order and keep aware of in a very com particularly in a complicated company with lots of different things going on. Martian came, came about in 2000 and, uh, 2019, and in that case, um, there were, it, the company involved was called Bluebell, and Bluebell sold ice cream, uh, high, you know, high-end ice cream, uh, much of it in the Midwest and particularly in Texas, um, and and in that case, just for a little bit of background, the, the problem that arose was that there were two or three listeria out, outbreaks of people who had consumed their ice cream, and um, the um, uh, plaintiffs in a lawsuit claimed damages as a result of the from the board as a result of their not doing anything about not maybe not the 
first of those outbreaks, but the subsequent outbreaks of, of listeria. And so, so uh, the, uh, there were several decisions leading up to the Marshan Court uh, and uh, the Supreme Court of Delaware in Marshan ru ruling the way it did. And I'm going to get to that in just one minute now. I'll get there quickly from here. The, but there were lower court decisions that, um, you know, in a in a way said, you you can't really blame an officer for not knowing what's going on out there. Um, in in the uh, in the business, the Supreme Court uh, of Delaware held a an en banc uh, hearing on the motion and came down with an en banc decision, unanimous decision, and and what Marshawn said was. You're right in the you judges below us who to reach the conclusion that the that a board can't be responsible for and directors can't be responsible for everything that goes on in their company. It just isn't. It's not practical. It's not feasible. It would it would make it probably make it impossible to get good directors to sit on a board. And so, um, but they said. Here is a situation where you've had two or th three, let's say, call it three serious outbreaks of listeria. They were aware of the fact that there had been outbreaks of listeria and they didn't take action to oversee the what safety measures were taken to to see that there wasn't another outbreak of listeria. So, um, and they said, the board does have duties like that. And what they said was, when you have a food company, the, the, such a, so in, in such a company in our, in our country, the, uh, it, is, it is mission critical, they called it, uh, which I think is a military term, uh, mission critical that there be safe food, safe safe products that are sold to the public to put into their bodies. And so, um, and they said here, here in this case, the board may, may well not have known what was being done to correct the listeria out, outbreak. And that's a problem, the, the Supreme Court said. You can't, you, if you, once you become aware that there are issues like this, mission, what they called mission critical issues, I think you could say very significant issues, if you like that term better, and that, and they hadn't done anything to make the, keep themselves informed about what was being done to see it didn't happen again. And so, they reversed the lower court and said that the, that the directors were potentially liable here. This was a, a pleading motion, and so it, it, it wasn't a final decision on the merits, but they said the directors can, can be held liable if it is shown they didn't do anything to see to it that there, was, uh, that there, were, there were safe products being sold to the public to eat, uh, and and it, it, if that that and that depended to some extent on the fact that this is a fairly large ice cream manufacturer. This was their main product. How could a board not think that wasn't an important issue, a significant issue to uh, the company? And how could they just ignore the fact that they didn't know? what was being done about it. Um, there are some other highlights about uh, that they were raised in the opinion that I'm not going to go into detail about because we we'll, we could spend the rest of the of this session on that case. But the the result of that decision has been 
even in Delaware, there, there is a process going on where courts are trying to deal with, you know, well, how important does the issue have to be for the board to have a duty to be aware of it? And there are cases, and not all the judges in, in chancery court agree uh, entirely on that issue. And so you get some differences in lower court opinions. The Delaware Supreme Court en banc unanimous decision it governs, but, but there are ways in which people can argue, well, that was a special case uh, because it was mission critical. The, but the real answer is, the rules didn't change very much, but they did change in the sense that there is a duty on the part of a board to stay on top of important things that are going on in their company. And so going back to what I was saying earlier, it's impossible to be aware of everything. It's impossible to be aware of everything. But a board member should at least know what the major products are and the major of the company and what the problems, it, major problems with that product are, if there are any. And it should know what the major risks to the company are. And they, and they should know that by setting, they themselves, the board members, setting up a system for information flow from employees, officers, outside experts, consultants, to give them the information they need to, to at least be aware of what's going on in things that are central to the company. And, and that is how one meets the, the, uh, the duty of oversight as a board director. Um, and so it, it is understandable, that rule, uh, it, there are a lot of ways of interpreting situations and what's important, what's so important that it should, in a given corporation that it should be that the board needs to set up an information flow. But it is an understandable uh, standard, and it and it as as time has evolved, you get some decisions that are that see that vary but they really vary around the edges that's that is the standard unless and until the law is changed by either the legislature or the supreme court we had um just at the end of january of this year a, a decision that by um by Chan vice chancellor uh vice chancellor travis laster in, in the delaware uh, chancery court relating to um, an, an issue of whether or not officers are all, also have a duty of oversight to be on top of things, to understand what's going on, to make sure that, that uh, if there are problems or risks, they're being addressed. And that often comes up in the context of, say, cybersecurity for, for officers of the company. They have to make, their job isn't to be cyber experts, and I'm going to get to experts in just a couple of minutes, but um, their job is to see that somebody's doing it to understand where it stands to hire people necessary. And and with that, uh, I'm going to I, I'm going to end the discussion of Marchand and the duty of oversight. Uh, it's still an evolving area even on the base principle that came out of the Marchand case. The new case uh, in, in which Ch Vice Chancellor Travis Lester found that there was a duty on the part of officers, uh, that is something that is, so, that is very new in Delaware law, that that is being talked about in, in some detail. There's a, there are an awful lot of issues relating to that, which are going to be resolved in the, in, in coming years probably, but certainly it's, have not been resolved yet. Things like, well, how senior do you have to be as an officer to have a duty of oversight? Are you saying any officer or any employee, or are you saying the CEO? What are you, what, what, where do you draw the line on who is responsible 
to have uh, have ex acted in a way that is consistent with an officer's duty of oversight. That an that question has never been clearly answered um, since this new case came down, and um, and then, and even in that case, a, a, no, a number of the, case, the lawsuits against directors and officers in that case have been thrown out by Travis Laster. He just, but he has this principle, and there are some potential defendants who are not out of the case. Um, it, there's an awful lot of development that's going to have to go on, but what it means for for those on the call who either are officers of corporations or uh, uh, represent of, uh, corporations and interact with those officers is until the, the dust settles, and that may take some time. Officers do have uh, do have to be careful that they are fulfilling whatever duty of oversight is found to exist, and that probably includes some very central issues to the company which are particularly those which are within the uh, the scope of what the, that individual officer is supposed to be aware of. And they have been doing their job of staying in touch with risks, problems, and finding solutions. But, but to get much beyond that at this point is probably uh, premature except to say to to those officers you you've got to do your job you've got to stay on top of what's going on you've got to see that that problems and risks are being addressed so that is that's Greg, the end of that section go Greg, ahead before we before we jump away from the duty slide we have two questions about duties um, which are very good and I think worth answering very quickly. So I will just read them out loud and give my initial thoughts and then you can chime in on anything you think um, should be added. So the first question has to do with, is there such thing as being on too many boards and is it um, a breach of a duty to be on too many boards? And the second question has to do with the duty of loyalty when a director sits on both a parent corporation board and um, the board of a maybe subsidiary created by the parent corporation. So with respect to the too many boards, um, I personally am not aware of any case law that says X number of boards is too many for you to be on. My thoughts are that it, it would probably be a fact specific inquiry. So someone could be on a lot of boards, um, but some of the boards may not require as much time and attention as others do. Um, some people can take on a lot of work. I, I think it really comes down to, are they upholding their duties on each board? Are they staying informed or are they kind of slacking up and unable to keep up with the work? So I think it's really fact specific. Are they still able to oversee what's going on in each um, corporation and to act consistently with their duties of care and oversight. With respect to the second question about making a decision when you're on the board of a parent company that could potentially negatively impact um, a, subsidiary a subsidiary company that you are also a board member on. That's an interesting question because it's not an issue necessarily where the board member personally stands to benefit from a decision that could be negatively affect the corporation, but um, the subsidiary could be negatively affected by the decision of the parent board. My thoughts and Greg, you may want to add on to this are you may want to consider whether or not the disinterested board members should be making that decision. So the ones who are not on both boards um, should be making the decision um, of that parent company. But Greg, um, I defer to you. What do you think? Well, I can take the second one first. I have some comments on both of them. So, um, First of all, it, it would depend to some degree on the structure of the subsidiary, but in general, the, the corporation will be 
will be a major owner of a of a of a sub, and therefore, it, they do have to have at, at least some concern over whether uh, over whether or not they're injuring the sub, because indirectly that will affect that will that could adversely affect the parent. Um, in general, I think uh, I. I think it is also somewhat fact specific and because there's some maybe some fact patterns where the injury is severe and uh, and maybe it doesn't hurt the parent very much um, if that's if but if that's if that's the situation you certainly would probably try to avoid uh, the you would probably try to avo to avoid the board of the parent uh, being free to do it, but I, but I think your answer, Sarah, it, it is is quite right on actually on both on both questions. But uh, I, on that one, if it it will depend on facts, but whether or not the there is injury to the parent, which the board member is on the board of, as indirectly as a result of the injury to the to the sub if it doesn't uh, they they may uh, i haven't seen a lot of law on that issue and i think uh that there may that may it may be very fact specific but i think if to the extent that the sub is wholly owned they probably don't have uh, and if the in the end if, if the sub is wholly owned, it is going to affect the parent. If it doesn't, isn't going to affect the parent, there may not be any duty to the sub. I, but I'm not. But I, I can't categorically answer that particular question because I've never had never had that particular issue. I, I do think that there are a lot of questions about um, about different kinds of companies. What kind of what are the, what? How are those duties affected? Being a, a sub a, on the board of a subsidiary uh, probably in, invokes some facts and circumstances that may affect how much oversight duty they have. The law relating to um, to nonprofit or public benefit corporations is uh, there is law putting putting responsibilities on directors but the, it is beyond the scope of today to get to it uh, to get to those issues but there are different kinds of corporations and they have they, they do have different kinds of rules um, on the um, on the question of how many boards I, I think once you get to the point of being of being on those board on too many boards for a given situation, um it, it's it becomes very fact specific and i think your answer on that is exactly right sarah i, I do think one added fact about being on too many boards uh, is, is that the proxy firms um and and some other organizations including some of the stock exchanges have guidelines on how many boards they think uh, people should be on. It, they're, they're, they don't have authority either. Either neither has the authority to prohibit someone being on more than the than the recommended number of boards. But it's not going to be a good fact in a lawsuit if the let's say the New York Stock Exchange says you shouldn't be on more than four public company boards or six, whatever the number is. And you're you're on eight or ten. I don't think that's a good fact if you get sued, <laughs> right? Um, and so uh, I think once again, I think Sarah is right. It's going to depend a lot on the facts. But there there are efforts by by institutions like the stock exchanges and like the um, proxy firms to try and guide people away from being on more than a reasonable number of boards. It will vary, as Sarah said, with the company and the characteristics of the company. And so you have to analyze every 
every situation based on those facts, as she said. Um, but it, it 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 is it would be troubling if somebody came in and said, "I'm on 12 boards," I, I and asked me for advice. I would tell them that's pretty troubling to me. I don't see how you can do the the what is required of you and under the duty of oversight if you're on 12 boards unless there there's something unusual about the companies. That's my add to add to your answers, but I do think your answers were correct. So next uh we're going to board expertise and reliance on experts. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and speed this up just a little bit. And so I'm gonna try and get through this quickly. I think one can summarize uh the summarize what's going on here and pretty pretty quickly. Um so the board has not only is not only permitted to rely on experts within the company or outside the company, i.e. experts. No, there's no question that that is permissible, but it goes beyond being permissible. It is also uh, it is also essential in some areas. Um, and so it would be wrong not to do that. And what do I have in mind? You know, one of our most common risks today for companies, so not the not the only common one, but one of them is uh, you know, would be cyber risks. Cyber risks. We all we all read about it in the papers or hear it on the news or what have you. And some of us actually work on some of the cyber cases. There are a tremendous number of um, problems that one encounters as a result of. Uh, I'll call it hacking as the shorthand of uh, of the uh, cyber system. It, it's incumbent, I think, on a and in that situation and in other situations, but this is our example, cyber. It it is incumbent on the board to recognize risks. That now we're back to Martian, right? Recognize the mission critical risks, mission the the significant risks that size up what they are, and then find out whether or not what is being done to deal with those risks or those problems is adequate. The board then may not. You may have some board members who are quite expert in cyber, but more more than likely, you're going to need specialists on cyber from within the company, or who are outside experts who are who whose company actually does does the uh, is in the business of of constructing ways of avoiding uh, cyber incidents, and uh, and so the board, as part of its oversight. Probably does have an has a have a duty to make sure that those things are being done right, and that the people that have been hired to do, take care of those issues have the proper credentials that they see that they have they can reasonably be thought to be doing doing their job well. The board does not have to learn everything that they're doing in detail because it. Many board members do not have the technical uh, technical ex experience to be able to evaluate the details, but they can evaluate: Do we have the right kinds of people doing these jobs? And so, um, and they they are in effect to some degree when they do this, they rely on those people they are in a sense also delegating at that point in time it's a form of delegation um i i think this one is pr this slide is pretty straightforward and in the interest of time uh, if people have questions questions on it please uh, please go forward but otherwise let's move on to the next one sarah will take up board delegation yes so very similar to what Greg was just discussing, there's certain situations where a board can or should delegate certain issues to um, a board committee, a certain officer with oversight of 
for example, compliance or something like that. Um, there are situations where a board should delegate, for example, I had mentioned before, there may be situations where the entire board is not independent on a decision. Um, so this could happen if board members are being sued um, and there's certain specific allegations against one or two board members. It would be a good idea to delegate the issue to a special litigation committee of um, members of the board who are disinterested in whatever the allegations are. So there's two main types of special committees. There's a special litigation committee and there's a special transaction committee. Um, in the transaction scenario, there may be a similar situation where certain board members are interested in the transaction and stand to benefit. In that case as well, it's good to delegate to a disinterested group of the board. Um, and that is again so that courts will give deference to whatever decision um, is ultimately made by the board because it was considered and evaluated by a disinterested group of directors. Um, there are other situations where boards may not have time to take on every specific issue that's important in facing the company. So even if the board is disinterested in whatever the potential litigation risk is or the entire board is disinterested in a transaction, it may still make sense to delegate um, the transaction or the litigation to a special committee of the board or an existing committee of the board. For example, sometimes audit committees are um, delegated certain litigations or investigations. And this is just because these issues can be incredibly time consuming. So it may not make sense for the entire board to be spending all of their time on this one issue when there are a multitude of issues that are simultaneously facing the company. So it may make sense to have a committee focus on that, report back to the board on what's happening. Um, there's also certain issues that have become very important right now for companies. So Greg mentioned cybersecurity or diversity. We have seen um, in many cases that the board may delegate these issues to specific committees of the board. Um, for example, cybersecurity could sometimes be delegated to a risk committee. Um, diversity could be delegated to some sort of HR type committee. Um, but again, when it's a really important focus of the company and it may involve a lot of time and work, it may make sense to delegate to a smaller group who will report back to the board. It's very important to make sure that any sort of delegation is in writing um, that shows who the issue is being delegated to, what the scope of delegation is. And you also want to have in writing that there's reporting coming back from whoever the issue is delegated to, to the board to show that the board is still um, staying apprised of everything that's going on, even though the issue has been delegated. Okay. Greg, I will um, turn it back to you. Thank you. I'm just, I, I would note very one sentence we the next session the second session of this we will also get into some of the things that sarah just talked about in including uh certain ways in which committees can be used and the importance of handling committees in a certain way that will come up in the next uh, in the next session of the of these um uh, uh of this series um, okay, so the business judgment rule, and once again, I'm going to try and get through this quickly. There are there are treatises written on the business judgment rule. There there's a lot. There are there are some complications, but this fundamental rule is fairly straightforward, and it's in that first paragraph of what's on the slide. The, pre the presumption, it's a rebuttable presum presumption, but not, nonetheless a presumption that constitutes the business judgment rule is that corporate directors who keep themselves reasonably informed, we're back to Marchand again a little bit, act in good faith. They have to act in good faith if, and, they, and they, they have not, they have to not be, uh, acting in their own interest, again, again, duty of loyalty, 
And uh, they have to have an, a reasonable and honest belief that they are acting within the lawful and le legitimate interests of the corporation and shareholders. Now, I, we could get off on a tangent, which we're not going to do today because there isn't time to do it. You could talk about, well, who are there other stakeholders that are relevant? We, may, we probably will touch on that in the next session, but we're not gonna touch on it today um, because we, we are, we're, we're a little low on time. So the, the, the only other thing I would say, and it's particularly important under Delaware law, is conflicts of interest and, and, their, and uh, duties of loyalty that are, would be affected if there were a conflict of interest are really disfavored in almost all courts and in certainly in Delaware. There are a lot of different rules that take that, that will uh, cause the outcome of a case to be different if a conflict of interest arises. So it's very important. If someone has a personal interest in, in, a, in a transaction or, or a, an action by the corporation, it's very important to make sure that you've you've eliminated people who have a conflict of interest from participating in the decisions. If you if you if you act in good faith though, and you are do and are have the the interests of the corporation and the shareholders in mind, you don't have a conflict, you're an independent director that the business judgment rule in all probability will protect you from from most liability and with that i'm 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 been because we are a little short on time i will wrap i'll wrap that one up and go we can go back to sarah yes so since we are strapped from for time i see there's a couple of questions that we probably won't be able to get to but um, Greg and my contact information will be at the end, so I would encourage you to shoot us an email. Um, I am going to get into some of the practical takeaways. Um, what can board members do and officers to make sure they are upholding their fiduciary duties? One really important um, item is that the board should regularly be assessing its composition and qualifications. Um, they should be evaluating whether there's any sort of conflicts of interest. Um, you know, Greg mentioned that boards don't have to be absolute experts in every issue facing the company. Um, but if there are issues that are really important to the way the business works, you wanna make sure, do we have board members that are generally familiar with these types of topics? Or is there someone who could be added that could um, add some expertise or knowledge in this particular issue that is really important to the company and regularly comes up. Um, another area that has become increasingly more important with the rise of ESG is diversity. And without getting into too many details, depending on where your company um, conducts business, um, whether it's international, what state it conducts business in, what state it's headquartered in, there are certain increasing regulations that either require there's a certain amount of diversity on the board, so there's a mandate for diversity of the board composition, or there's a requirement that the company discloses um, the composition of the board in terms of diversity. So for example, there's a NASDAQ rule that currently requires publicly listed companies to disclose the diversity of board members and provide an explanation if there is a lack of diversity. There is a federal um, lawsuit going on right now challenging the SEC's authority to implement this rule. But in general, you should check where does your company operate and are there any sort of regulations, whether disclosures or mandates that have to do with board diversity and are we meeting those standards. Um, delegation of authority and engaging experts, Greg and I, I think cover that in, in some depth. Um, building reporting structures, again, boards cannot be in the weeds of the 
day-to-day -day operations, you want to make sure that there are adequate reporting and structures in place to the board and that there are written documents reflecting this structure. That way, if a board member ever gets sued, you have these documents showing, oh, no, we have all these structures in place. We are, are given regular reports by X, Y, and Z on this topic. Um, and particularly in board meetings, when boards are receiving reports on certain topics, the meeting minutes should reflect that. Again, this is one way to insulate against um, certain claims that there's not an adequate oversight process in place. And Greg, I'll turn it to you for the last slide. Right, and so and I, uh, we are running out of time, so I'm gonna move very quickly, but one of these in particular, um, I think uh, is important to focus on. Internal controls in a corporation are very, are very important. Um, Accounting problems um, come up frequently within corporations, and you need one a corporation needs internal controls to uh, to make sure that they minimize the the amount of loss associated with with accounting issues and other issues uh, involving internal controls. Once again, it, the board members may not be experts in all areas of internal controls. They should know that internal controls are important. They may know some areas where on internal controls. But for example, um, in, a, in a case that we, it, where there was an internal investigation that Sarah and I worked on uh, until recently, uh, we met over, over time uh, three times with, a, with the person in charge of internal controls at the company and uh, and did a download each time in detail at length to make sure that we understood uh, what had been done. And in fact, there was a great deal done. And they, these the people in charge of internal controls were former partners at big, big uh, four accounting firms. So we gave them, we gave in our opinion, a clean a bill of health on that issue of oversight of internal controls because they had people in place who really knew what they were doing on setting up the internal controls. But it, they're very. This is a very important area. The board and stakeholders um, will try and get. I will try to get into a little bit to the stakeholders issue. There isn't simply isn't time today to do it and do it any justice. Stakeholders are other people who are considered by the board in making decisions, and that would include employees, uh, uh, and that would include uh, clients, it would include perhaps the location uh, of the, uh, the, the community in which the uh, corporation operates. There are and, and a number of additional stakeholders. It's an interesting topic. It's very much intertwined with ESG, and uh, and we will try and find time in the next session to do it to to go into that in a little bit more detail uh, to do it justice. Uh, I the last item I think is kind of self self um, self explanatory. If if you are dealing with a regulator, you have someone who feels comfortable talking off. You know. Uh, Kind of offline or a less in a less formal way with with the regulators in or even in a formal way you try to get more uh, information from regulators to help minimize your risks it seems to me that's an uh, fairly obvious tactic that uh, people who are dealing with regulators need to look for opportunities to get as much information as they can about the regulator's point of view. And with that, I'm done. Right. Sarah, do you have anything else? You, you're on mute. I do not have anything else to add. I think we have the CLE code on the screen for everyone who's looking to get CLE credit. And thank you so much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Yeah, you know, it, I, I would like to, I'll echo Sarah, th thank you all. And and it, it was um, it was a pleasure uh, to be in front of this group. And um, I, I would also say every time uh, we do 
something like this, and we've spent a, many, many hundreds and hundreds of hours on issues that relate to corporate governance in, in, with clients, and as well as on, in webinars, there's always something new, a little facet that comes up, and that is just a in, very interesting and complicated area, a lot of considerations, and I hope you enjoyed it and felt the same way about this presentation. Have a good day, everyone.